Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, today. Uh, very excited for what will be an interesting and far-ranging, although very compact, conversation with uh, Eli Broverman, uh, founder of the Treasury and also co-founder of uh, Betterment. Uh, I'm Jeff Banman, uh, Principal of Banman Advisors, uh, founder of Block Agent, and also head of regulatory strategy for Kalshi, the new exchange that's launching a new asset class called Event Contracts. Uh, Eli, we're really thrilled to have you here. Uh, welcome. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your uh, background. Hey, Jeff. Yeah, it's so great to be with you and, and the audience. Um, so uh, I, I'm a fintech guy uh, through and through. Uh, my, my current time and energies uh, are spent building Treasury, as you mentioned, uh, which is a collection of fintech founders from around the world uh, it, with the aim of just bringing all the great companies, both in uh, the United States, where I'm based, and, and everywhere around the world, um, closer together so that we can help each other grow and collaborate. Because really, you know, fintech begets fintech. Uh, and I started that uh, effort with my partners, uh, James Layfield, who built Rise with, uh, uh, in conjunction with Barclays. It's the world's largest uh, incubator of fintech companies with locations across the globe. And uh, as well as with uh, our other partner, Jeff Cruttenden, who built Acorns, which was the first a company uh, of its kind to offer uh, investing through a mobile only experience. And, and many people are familiar with Acorns. They have uh, millions of customers and they really transformed the space as it pertains to leading with mobile. Uh, I myself uh, came to the fintech space a long time ago, um, uh, over a dozen years ago, to start my first company, Betterment, uh, which you uh, which you mentioned and our audience members may know. Betterment today is a, uh, a company that provides a wide array of cash and wealth management services. Uh, we're well known as the world's first robo-advisor. Um, we started the company way back when to address the problem for people of what should I do with my money? Because nobody was using um, technology in the internet to really help people um, in, a, in a simple but powerful way, just manage their money and build wealth for the future. And today, Betterment uh, helps over half a million customers. We manage uh, over $25 billion for them. And I think we're really helping them build a brighter financial future and a better life for, the, life for themselves. Yeah, that, that's a great story. And I definitely want to drill, drill down on some of uh, kind of what, what it was it took to get Betterment going and uh, you know, what some of the insights were. Uh, you did mention that one of your uh, partners at the Treasury was one of the founders of Rise. I'm actually a, a big fan of Rise. I've been a, a mentor to a number of the, the, the companies there, uh, often around uh, regulatory uh, issues because of my background as a senior official at the CFTC and working on the intersection of uh, regulation and kind of FinTech innovation. Um, so looking back on your experience, uh, Part of what you built with Betterment was a better onboarding experience. What insights led you to thinking that onboarding was going to be so important? And why was that, in fact, so important to the success of the platform? Sure. I, you know, I think there, there were really two, two insights um, that were driving how we thought about the product. And the first was just build something from a customer-centric um, vantage point, right? I mean, there's so, like, we, we ourselves as founders felt so much frustration over the way that financial services products were built um, and they were built, you know, for the bank or the financial institutions interest first, the customer second. And so we wanted to turn that on its head. But then the second, as you point out, really was about, you know, there's got, we've got to make it easier for people to move their money, to move their, um, to, to move their business around. In a lot of ways, I think, you know, the business model of traditional financial services sometimes boils down to, um, you know, uh, keeping the customer from leaving, right? Uh, you know, it's not, you, it's not intrinsically sticky. You just try to keep the doors shut as much as, you, as possible. And, and that's not always intentional. It's just how it works out. It becomes such a difficult process um, to, to move from one place to another. And, you know, we thought 
you know, and this is going back a ways, but obviously like, you know, we have the capabilities to build an onboarding experience where everything can be digital. It can be quite seamless. Um, and that's really how you grow a huge customer base, right? Is you just make it incredibly easy to get on board, start doing business. And as you, over the years, you know, we've thought about, well, some of this has to be in the form of having multiple front doors, right? Customers want to start doing business with financial services companies in different ways. Sometimes you might need a loan. Sometimes you might just need information. Sometimes you, um, you need a do, new way of spending on a card. And sometimes you're ready for a full financial plan or wealth management. Um, you know, every company builds different pieces of this. But I think when it comes to onboarding, it should be as frictionless as possible. But you should also have different pathways um, because you're going to have customers always at different experiential points. Uh, and I think that's been a big key for us. And then, you know, lastly at Betterment, you know, one of the ways that we have particularly innovated is on asset onboarding, right? Um, we're a wealth manager. People come with all different sorts of pre-existing assets in their portfolio. Sometimes it's nothing. Sometimes people are just starting out investing and they just have cash. But if you have existing holdings that are either traditional assets or non-traditional assets, you have to think about what are the easiest ways, the least friction um, ways that people can move their assets onto your platform. That's really what unlocks growth in that space. Yeah, that's... Um... No, that's a, tre a tremendous story. And, you know, you're dealing with, with, with lots of people and you're dealing with people's money and you're asking them to trust you with it over the internet. Uh, you know, maybe today people take that for granted a little bit more in terms of, uh, you know, trusting a, a platform uh, over the internet or, or with an app. But certainly, you know, going back to the time when you guys were getting that business off the ground, uh, you know, much more radical. So looking, looking at it today, uh, you know, you're still very focused on the, the fintech space. Uh, you know, we see there's a lot of energy, a lot of interest in, in that space. Uh, has it become any easier, you know, to build a fintech challenger brand to launch a new platform? Uh, is it any, any easier? Is it actually harder than it was back then? Oh, gosh. Uh, I, I would say it's absolutely easier. Um, you know, consumer attitudes towards challenger brands have completely changed. Uh, and I think maybe we could talk about that some later, um, but that's certainly one area. Uh, second area is building a business takes money. Um, and usually that's in the form of, um, of venture investment. And when I first started building Betterment, um, the venture community, um, you know, we really felt like was not interested in financial services. It was a high, heavily regulated, um, intensive space. It was much more interesting to build gaming or social applications that were not regulated. And maybe there, some of those things are becoming regulated, but back in those days, they weren't. And we were sheepish about telling um, potential investors that we were a heavily regulated entity and we had invested a lot of time and energy into building up that infrastructure. Um, today, you know, we, um, you know, we would pound our chests about that. Um, if we were starting a company and I encourage founders to make sure they're building the right regulatory structure because it's a competitive advantage to own that. Um, and, uh, and venture investors, I think, don't, not only are they open to it, they're seeking it out. Um, and then the third area is really about the attitudes of regulators themselves. I mean, I think, you know, first of all, think about what's happening around the world in places such as Singapore, Australia, the UK, regulators are actively looking to set up sandboxes to test scenarios and identify how technology can be leveraged um, to solve financial problems in either the consumer space or the business space. You know, many regulators are determining ways they can be that an active part of the process and then enable it um, instead of just responding to it. In the U.S., um, uh, again, where, where I'm based, I'd, I'd say it's, it's a little bit different, right? Um, the regulators um, don't see themselves as having a dual role of both enabling and being a gatekeeper. Um, they take a more traditional approach of just being a gatekeeper. Um, and, you know, that's a, that's a philosophical difference. But nevertheless, um, the approach to gatekeeping has definitely changed. I mean, I, I think I never... Um, I never encountered regulators who didn't want to be um, 
to have an open mind and to try um, to uh, to work with us. Um, but frankly, I mean, they were befuddled, befuddled and bewildered when they first encountered Betterment and just couldn't understand, um, you know, what in the world we were trying to do by offering financial advice through software. Um, and we said, you know, we'll probably never speak to many of our customers. And um, it took some time for them to wrap their minds around that. Uh, and today, I, mean, I think you see an explosion of licenses being granted to fintech companies. And that itself tells you that regulators are um, uh, ready for the story. They understand what, they, uh, what they're encountering when a challenger brand comes to them for permission. Yeah, it, it, I, I agree. It's it's been uh, on the on the regulator side. There's been you know really terrific progress and evolution. And you know, a few years ago when I was at the CFTC and doing kind of the research for you know what eventually we launched is uh, the first uh, U.S. market regulator, you know, FinTech Innovation Hub Lab CFTC. I you know studied and met with regulators from some of those jurisdictions we're talking about in the UK, Singapore, Australia to learn from them. And of course. You know, we learned a lot from them. Uh, you know, it's not, uh, you know, the regulators are trying to uh, engage and they're, uh, you know, trying to be, you know, much more of a partner, though, as you said, um, you know, there's only a few of them like Singapore that have a sovereign wealth fund attached to it. You know, most of them may be more in the um, kind of gate, gatekeeper uh, size. What, what, what are uh, kind of looking at your current activities? Are there any particular uh, brands or companies you're focusing on with uh, with the Treasury or you know, any sectors that you're looking at where you see an opportunity for this kind of challenger brand disruption or other exciting fintech? Sure. Um, well, I mean, first and foremost, right, I, I think there's, uh, there's a general theme about uh, global cooperation. Um, we haven't seen, um, you know, yet enough of bringing um, founders and their teams from different parts of the world together to, to share and collaborate. Uh, and clearly, um, you know, these markets are really huge. And so usually we see in particular sectors that um, there are teams working on similar challenges and solutions in different parts of the world. They're not competitors. Uh, you know, like you know, most fintech brands, most financial services brands are not global. Even the biggest banks rarely have a global footprint. So there's a lot to be gained by cooperating with one another, and that's kind of thematically the focus of Treasury. As we think about companies um, that we work with, you know, the 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 driving business model of Treasury is to invest in um, in in some of the Treasury members that are you know the best fits for us to help add value to. Uh, and a couple of spaces that we think are interesting. Um, one is uh, one is insurance. Um, you know, we haven't yet seen, I'd say, quite the breakout success stories in insurance from other fields. Um, there are so certain subsets of insurance that have been ripe for full automation. Um, uh, you know, I think of renter's insurance and lemonade is a success story there. But when you get into more complex insurance products, well, it's the old adage of insurance is sold, not bought. Um, it is a highly consultative sales process because these products are incredibly difficult to understand. Um, and, uh, and it's not an exciting thing to buy insurance. It's not about opportunity. It's about downside and um, you know, lots of financial services is about limiting downside. And, and that's a place I think where, you know, maybe the, the future is not about full automation, the way we've seen with certain types of challenger plays, but it's about giving technology to um, the professionals in the space to supercharge them. Um, there's one company called Covered by Sage that we've invested in that we think is um, is working towards that effort. Um, it's a great story. Uh, you know, it's really trying to do for insurance what Compass did for for real estate. Um, you know, you keep you know make make those professionals way more efficient and effective than than they already are. Uh, another space is employee benefits. I see so much opportunity for uh, employees to op optimize their compensation outside of you know, just the gross pay. Uh, and it's, it's another one of those places where, you know, thematically, what do we see going on in the world? We see, you know, increasing wealth disparity 
Um, and we see, you know, we, we see the people at the top ranks, not only getting, you know, the bigger top line salary, but having all sorts of services around them to completely optimize their pay. Uh, and there's, uh, you know, there's so much opportunity to optimize like that for rank and file employees. And it's, it's one of those things that we need. Uh, there's another company we've invested in called Carver Edison. It's doing that. Uh, that's doing just that. It's helping employees with their employee stock purchase plans, which is a way is a form of equity compensation um, in the United States and many other countries around the world to help public company employees own stock in their companies. They're difficult, complicated plans. They're not well understood. They're not well taken advantage of. And Carver Edison is um, is trying to change that space so employees completely maximize what is a really valuable benefit and becoming a shareholder in your company and increasing your your take home pet. Well, yeah, those uh, employee stock auction plans or ESOPs. I remember when I was a a very uh, junior lawyer having to look at some of those things. They were, uh, you know, they were they were quite intimidating. Um, so so we're up against it in in terms of time. Um, Maybe can I just run through a couple of last things? Uh, just sure. get, let's just get a 10 or 15 second uh, response from you. Being an innovator in New York, there's West Coast tech, there's global centers. Is New York a good place to, to do FinTech and why? Well, New York is definitely one of the spaces, uh, you know, is, is, is where FinTech leads, right? Uh, a lot of tech leads in the Bay Area as, as far as, as North America, but you know, financial services, the, New York is the capital of this uh, of, uh, for the U.S. And, and arguably for the world. Uh, and tech is not just about um, building software, but also about domain expertise. Um, so New York, New York has been and continues to be uniquely positioned to be the leader in fintech. Got it. Domain expertise. Okay. Latin American fintech. We're seeing that heating up. What do you think is the, the biggest drive ever or what can accelerate growth of Latin fintech? This right here. I mean, you know, like everything happens on on your phone. Uh, and I think when you look at the Latin American market, um, you know, it's so receptive to building services that are exclusively on your phone. Uh, and that's that's the gateway to, to really revolutionizing financial services in so many markets, including Latin. Got it. Got it. And finally, you know, 2020, you know, challenging year in so many ways, COVID pandemic. Uh, how do you see the relationship of COVID to, to fintech? Accelerator, challenge, what, you know, how does that affect the way you look at things? Sure. I mean, you know, COVID obviously has um, dramatically changed behavior um, uh, across the world. Uh, you know, we've, we see something like 40% of re, uh, survey respondents saying that their the way they interact with their banks has changed. They've, com they've moved completely mobile. Um, it's an accelerant, right? We've already seen this. You know, we see, you know, I think I've also read uh, surveys that say something like almost 60% of people have, you know, started using cash, you know, less since the pandemic set in. That's, you know, that's in the backdrop of these these trends were already um, fast afoot, they were already happening. So to see those sorts of upticks in what's already a rapid trend, it's like the curve had been bent and it was bent even further by COVID. And I think that's the, you know, that's the real takeaway here is, uh, is we've changed trajectories on these types of cons uh, consumer behaviors. Uh, and those things, well, you know, we will renormalize. Uh, we all believe in 2021. Um, those are trends and changes to behavior that will be lasting. Fantastic. Well, the, the, these 15 minutes have really uh, flown, flown by. Thank you sure so have. much for joining us. Uh, Eli, where can people go if they want to uh, follow you or learn more about what's going on with uh, the things you're working on? Go to thetreasury.com. You can connect with me, my partners, um, James Layfield, Jeff Crutton in there, and all the other founders uh, who are part of the treasury. We want to bring people together. So if you're building something great in the fintech space, that's the way to reach us. And we want you to join our community. Great. Fantastic. And uh, Jeff Banman, Banman Advisors, thanking you again, Eli, thanking the audience for uh, turning in and enjoy the rest of the conference and have a great day, everyone. Thank you.